Hello and welcome everyone to our um, webinar this evening, part of our career success series on criminal justice careers and hot trends. I'm Andy Dixon, I'm the Assistant Vice President of Marketing here at Colorado State University Global. And I'm pleased to welcome you today to, to our discussion, um, which is actually a repeat discussion from a webinar we ran back in March, but brought it back by popular demand. We're so excited to have all of you here today to kind of hear about what's happening in the field of criminal justice and law enforcement administration, especially. I do want to introduce Dr. Michael Skiba. Uh, he is a program chair of criminal justice here at CSU Global. He has over 22 years of experience in the private sector and has been in academia for the last 15 years. And we're very fortunate enough to have him here oversee all of our criminal justice programs and specializations. Um, with that, Dr. Skiba, take it away. Great, thank you, Andrew. I uh, appreciate the introduction, and uh, and again, thank you for uh, thank you for attending. Um, and as uh, as Andy mentioned, um, you know, definitely encourage you to use the chat box. Um, you know, we do have kind of an idea of, of what we'd like to talk about, but um, we are more than happy. I'm more than happy to expand on anything that I'm specifically speaking about uh, in the in the presentation. But also, uh, uh, you know, no problem going off topic uh, and, and exploring any other areas as well. Um, and really, the idea is to kind of showcase, um, you know, what I've what I've seen both on a professional uh, perspective and from an academic perspective, uh, kind of the trajectory of criminal justice, um, where it's going, uh, you know, what we're seeing in the industry, um, and and kind of how how it's an industry really of, of lifelong learning. Uh, how it's it's not an area where you you know get one degree and then kind of. Uh, put the flag in the sand and then and then continue for 20, 30 years. I mean, it's it's an industry where it's so exciting to explore different areas and you can do that at any point in your career. Um, and I'm a perfect example of that. You know, I've, I've kind of popped around into different areas. Um, I originally got my, my MBA in business. Um, <clears throat> Actually, I got my undergrad uh, in criminal justice. I uh, got my MBA in business and then a PhD in criminal justice. So I, I kind of hopped back and forth. Um, I did 22 years uh, in private sector uh, in international investigations. So I worked in white collar crime. Uh, I worked in organized crime in New York City uh, and abroad uh, investigating different types of uh, terrorist cells and fraud activity. So uh, very exciting stuff. But uh, and I was able to hop around uh, through that. Um, which is uh, which is fantastic. So I just want to share some of those uh, experiences with you. Um, but but firstly, you know, one of the things that we're seeing in criminal justice is that it is an area uh, that really has job security. You know, um, uh, we know of course the the police field uh, is something that that we will always need. You know, we will always need people to keep us safe, uh, to make sure we're not speeding going to work. Uh, we're running errands uh, and all the way up to, um, you know, investigating major crimes and international occurrences. Um, so we know police officers from local to federal um, are going to continue to grow. And we're seeing, we're expecting about a 10% job growth uh, in the upcoming years. Um, and, and along with that, we see investigations, both public and private sector, you know, growing upwards of 20% in the next couple of years. Um, and that involves pretty much all different areas uh, uh, you know, of investigations from forensics to white collar crime, uh, to you know, I see traditional uh, homicide and, and kidnapping and things like this. Um, we're also gonna see an uh, area of, of growth in, in fraud uh, and what I call cyber, cyber jobs. Um, you know, and, and both of those areas I personally have seen grow and, and that's kind of a, uh, you know, an industry area that I ended up in, um, if you will, that, that, that showed, you know, revealed itself to be incredibly exciting. So we're going to see growth in fraud, uh, you know, in, in 10 years and also in that cyber field upwards of 30%. Uh, no surprise. I mean, we're, we're being, um, you know, bombarded with technology um, and that brings additional vulnerabilities. You know, so we're going to need people to investigate, to look at those types of crimes, to help companies uh, plug those gaps and address vulnerabilities. So, um, you know, from a personal perspective and from a, a research perspective, we know the studies show that this is going to be a continued area uh, to get into in the upcoming years. So, you know, here's just, just you know, another uh, backbone to what I just talked about. You know, there's so many different career opportunities, um, you know, again, in, in, in policing from state, local, federal um, to, uh, uh, you know, to correctional facilities, 
um, to more humanitarian um, and rehabilitative approaches, um, and, and also in the private sector. So, you know, there's that balance between public and private sector jobs. Um, you know, the public sector jobs, of course, are those that are sworn in, um, you know, the state, federal, and local, uh, but also the private sector, you know, banks, financial institutions, um, companies, every company has a security office. Um, you know, most companies have um, internal people to investigate fraud um, and, and maybe, uh, you know, internal uh, discrepancies. So this is an area that's gonna continue to grow. And, and another thing too is that, uh, you know, these jobs are not low paying, um, you know, so, so most, you know, police officers, median pay is, is around the mid 60s. Uh, probation is in the 50s. Um, emergency management investigations on the private end, anywhere from 60s up to 70s. Um, and that's going to continue to grow. And these are just, you know, average salaries. Um, you know, there are additional opportunities available as one moves into management um, and even international and global experiences, which, which again is where I came from. So I know firsthand um, that these are usually just a starting point. So it can be not only incredibly rewarding, uh, but it, you know, from a personal professional standpoint, but also a financial standpoint. So you are rewarded uh, for, for those, um, you know, those activities that you're doing. So a couple um, you know, slides on some examples of career pathways. And this just is, is kind of a visualization uh, of our industry um, and, and kind of that, that lifelong learning that I mentioned. Um, and what, what we've done here is just kind of um, you know, show some pathways. So across the top, you know, to all of our law enforcement professionals, um, you know, we know that a lot of them look to maybe advance within their departments. Um, we know that some of them look to, you know, once they do their 20 or 30 years to maybe move on to second careers. Uh, military as well, um, you know, uh, those that look to advance within those military departments, but also thinking uh, on, uh, you know, retirement, what are they going to do on retirement? So, so what these, these here do is kind of just showcase, um, you know, the, the pathway that one can take, uh, you know, all the way from entry level, um, all the way through, like, for example, uh, if we look at the fraud management uh, kind of track that we've, uh, that we've laid out here, you know, one can start uh, as a entry level, uh, operational level police officer. But if one has an interest in this area, uh, you know, to start with a bachelor's in criminology, uh, you know, and then get into a graduate certificate in fraud management um, and then move into maybe the private sector fraud investigative field uh, and then look at a specialization in fraud management. You know, so that will that will support that lifelong learning uh, that that, you know, is, is such a very you know, incredible part about uh, about our industry. And the second example uh, on the second slide, we showcase uh, some of our specializations. So our uh, you know, for example, forensic investigations uh, and emergency management, uh, two very, very hot fields right now. Um, and these are, these are examples of, of how one could, um, you know, maybe start at an entry level or even in a totally different field and migrate into, into this area. Um, you know, so it's not the kind of uh, field or industry where, um, you know, uh, uh, credentials are um, kind of, um, I don't want to say required, but um, you know, one can slowly gain experience and academics and, and gain that expertise and knowledge base and, and advance within their careers uh, and explore other areas uh, as well. And just to expand upon that a little bit, so I'm going to give Michael a little break to get a drink of water and stuff before he goes into the actual hot trends in these individual areas. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about how those career pathways kind of relate to what CSU Global does. Um, so, so a few key points here that, that I think is important for every industry to understand, especially in today's dynamic workforce. You know, the value of higher education is incredibly high right now because there is such a, you know, competitive job market out there. So for you to be able to demonstrate career success and specific knowledge within a, in an area of expertise, is very important for um, a lifelong of, of career potential. So the ability to keep growing through those uh, different pieces and, and be able to advance into different subjects is something that we want to make sure and stress. And, and please feel free to ask questions as we go through this. But um, the idea of stackable credentials allows you to actually utilize all of those skills you gain 
um, so you can get the, the knowledge and skills and abilities you need right now for that next career step that you might be taking, but utilize that credit towards your long-term success. Um, so this is a very kind of complicated idea to, to understand sometimes because most people think of a degree as being the end point of, of your education. But at Global here, we, we really are focused on getting, making sure that you have the practical knowledge and experience throughout each of those pathways to really build a career path that's customized to you. Um, so that's personalized course material, your ability to really choose the assignment options and utilize real world examples in each of your courses that, that you want to be taking advantage of. It's through partnerships that I'm sure Michael will go into later as well, that we utilize some external expertise and knowledge to, to get you to utilize real world statistics and pieces in your research. Um, career tools, uh, su uh, simulations, and supplemental learning, and, and a lot of things that are built into the courses that can really assist in those areas. And then finally, again, those, those pathways that may not be readily you know, seen in terms of a traditional uh, criminal justice career, where cyber, data analytics is so big in this field right now, organizational leadership, the ability to mix and match some additional specializations and certificates to really meet your career goals, um, and, and utilizing your career coaches and career support in order to make that successful. So um, that's a little bit about how you can utilize some of the tools at Global while you're building those personalized learning paths. So um, I'll turn it back over to you, Michael, to now talk through some of those hot trends that I'm sure most people are here to really hear about. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. So um, what we've done here is, um, I, you know, kind of hand selected some of the hottest areas right now. And and what I'd like to talk about is, is kind of three, three points on each, you know, the background skills needed, um, the pathways, uh, you know, potential career pathways and, and a career story uh, just for myself based on my, you know, over two decades of, of experience here in these areas. Um, and, and so first thing I'd like to talk about private security government contracting. Um, and, and this is an area where I think traditionally when, you know, I, I, the, the on the street um, kind of uh, opinion of this is, um, okay, you know, you're going to be deployed immediately, uh, you know, a, to, to a very high threat area. Uh, you're going to be provided, uh, you know, weapons and, and maybe uh, security to military forces, because uh, that's what we see in the media. Uh, this is not true. This is probably a extremely small percentage of private security or government contracting jobs that are, that are out there. I would say probably 5%. Um, I personally have been involved in many different co government contracts. Uh, and, and many private security contracts, um, and they were not in high threat environments. Um, you know, they they were uh, you know various uh, very various different areas. Um, and, and getting right to the the background and skills needed um, in in this field or in this area, um, really any type of expertise, any type of background um, uh, could help. You know, I, I remember doing one contract uh, with someone from the medical field. Um, and they had a, a, a strong background um, in, in health sciences, but also had an investigative uh, degree as well. So they had a criminal justice degree um, along with that. So, so there's any area, any specific area or background that can make yourself unique um, will, will absolutely uh, uh, stand out and, and is, is definitely needed uh, in this field. Um, and, you know, there could be a, a multitude of different pathways um, that, that are involved in that. Um, it could be accounting, you know, it could be getting accounting degree and some investigative skills. It could be military. Um, it could be law enforcement. It could be uh, any type of, of, of security or protection. Um, but also, you know, any, any of those, you know, um, you know white collar uh, type of occupations in, like such as auditing or, um, you know, actuarial work uh, are in high demand. You know, and some of the, uh, you know, some of the specific uh, situations that I've been involved in or contracts that I've had uh, were working for government. So I actually did some work uh, in the Netherlands, the Department of Ministry. Uh, I had a few contracts. I did some training work for them and, uh, and I, I kind of developed a protocol for investigations uh, on, on white collar crime cases. Um, I worked with um, governments in Dubai and Malaysia uh, as well, uh, looking at uh, developing uh, kind of a protocol for internal and corporate fraud. Um, and, and in those in those contracts, I worked very closely with with other individuals, uh, you know, kind of in a team environment that brought something different to the table. Um, so, so these are areas where, again, um, you know, depending on what kind of background you have, you can absolutely leverage those um, into 
uh, you know, into these type of uh, type of positions. But again, very exciting area to work with, and, and a lot of them are contract or, or uh, freelance based, so they're they're limited contracts. So you can work, you know, two months on one, um, you know, finish that project, work two months, six months. Um, so it's it's kind of a nice, um, you know, a nice mix, a nice different exposure uh, that that you might get. So next, uh, fraud, white collar crime. So this is an area very near and dear to my heart. Um, I would say this is this is really my area of, of expertise, uh, and and was over my my 22 years. Um, you know, and again with my background, I came from primarily a business background, uh, and I think that's really what helped me. Um, you know, be unique in the investigative criminal justice area because I had something different to offer, but. So I had a business background, but I always had a spin on business investigation. So, um, you know, what I brought to a company, a consultation, uh, et cetera, was the ability to, you know, look at a financial statement, to uh, perform an interview uh, of someone, to look at, um, you know, asset misappropriation. Um, you know, not real hardcore accounting principles, but, you know, I kind of knew enough to be dangerous uh, is what I would always say. Um, but then I could actually translate that into something workable, right? Um, so I could sit across from a, a, you know, a CEO or operational individual, identify the fraud, and then, and then kind of make it into something actionable from a criminal justice perspective, you know, whether that got segued or handed off to law enforcement, or um, they look to get, get you know, a contract off their books. Um, that was something very interesting. But this, this undoubtedly is an area where I think will continue to grow. Um, and it's really an exciting area because, you know, a traditionally research shows that these types of criminals are more cognitive than other criminals. So I, I quite enjoyed working in this industry uh, because it was very challenging. You know, you'd be faced with, uh, um, uh, you know, individuals that had a, a you know, very equaled background uh, than myself. Uh, so it was, it was very challenging. Uh, it was kind of like a chess match, if you will. Um, and I think that's, that's one reason why a lot of people are drawn to this field. Um, so as far as backgrounds and skills, um, you know, uh, usually what we see in this area is any type of, of course, white collar crime, fraud investigations, um, accounting, like I mentioned, any type of actuarial work, um, but also, you know, an, an investigative uh, aspect as well. So being, being very inquisitive uh, and, and kind of, you know, really enjoying digging deep into issues and, and maybe not taking uh, what you see at, at face value, you know, um, kind of being... Um, always suspect um, and, and looking for, you know, additional evidence and things to, uh, to support you. Um, as far as uh, pathways uh, go, I, I think it's really important to, to have some expertise of, like I said, where that rubber meets the road, you know, translating what you're finding into something actionable. So I think, um, you know, having a specialization or a master's degree uh, in, in some aspect of fraud absolutely will help or even a certification. Uh, for that matter, um, you know, so having maybe a mix of, of credentials, you know, uh, maybe an MBA or a, a bachelor's in business or organizational behavior with a specialization uh, in fraud uh, would, would make yourself very, uh, very, very dangerous. Um, and, and as far as career stories, like I mentioned, um, you know, I, I did work um, for, um, you know, many companies on the private and public sector in this area. Um, and I think that's that's one of the most important things um, that, that I can offer is, uh, uh, to someone looking and getting this career, there's so many opportunities domestically and internationally uh, that overlap. And, and quite frankly, a lot of a lot of companies I have found um, don't know what they're faced with, you know, because it's hard to quantify uh, this type of crime. It's hard to understand what their problem is. Um, so, so you know, a lot of times what I would uh, come in to do is was um, you know find a problem. I called myself the problem solver uh, when I was doing consultations because that's what I would do. I'd go in and try to find vulnerabilities, try to find threats, uh, test their systems, um, and then and then give them the appropriate tools uh, to uh, uh, you know to try to um, you know thwart those efforts in the future. So risk manage uh, risk management and emergency management. So um, you know I really think that. Uh, that this area is is going to be one of the hottest uh, to grow in in the next few years, um, you know I have just seen from a professional perspective, um, you know uh, questions being asked, uh, you know and, and job postings and people asking me um, if they know people that have these qualifications. 
Um, and I'll tell you why, because even in my, um, you know, my career, uh, this, this job has expanded. Um, you know, so traditionally emergency management fell under the public sector. So you'd have, um, you know, maybe an emergency manager at a fire department and their job was to coordinate um, all the county and maybe local emergency management situations that happen. Um, and of course, as, as the environment changed, um, you know, as in, as in you know, we, we face new threats, uh, both domestically, natural disasters, man-made disasters, so uh, things like school shootings and campus shootings, um, all the natural disasters. I mean, last year was more, one of the most financially impactful, um, caused the most financial damage on, on insurance companies in the financial sector ever uh, as far as disasters. So, I mean, you need people to manage that, to try to forecast, assess those risks, um, so th these roles have expanded immensely, and I really think this is an area uh, that, that, that could be a strong focus, and, and quite frankly, it's a very exciting area to work in. Um, I had the opportunity to work in many different um, applications. Um, when I worked in the insurance space, I was actually on a, a catastrophe team for about four years, and what my job was, um, was to respond um, to these natural disasters. So if there was an earthquake, let's say, on the West Coast, I was deployed, and my job really was to help coordinate uh, both, both you know, the the uh, and and deal with the policyholders that we had there, uh, but also try to prevent risk, uh, try to try to secure the buildings uh, from looters and things like this. So very, very exciting career, um, and that was that was purely public sector. Um, you know, that was not um, you know overlapping into the public sector, which is a whole different area. Uh, same skill set, uh, and this is where um, you know jobs with FEMA. Uh, come into play. Um, and I think, you know, the background and skills needed uh, could be anything. Um, you know, I've worked with administration from schools um, that have absolutely no background uh, in this field, but they have been appointed as a risk manager for their school or school district. Um, and, then, and then they, you know, have to go through the appropriate training, you know, getting a degree or certification uh, in this area. Um, so I think that's what's important is anyone with, with any type of background can, can get into this area. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things uh, from a program perspective that, that we've tried to do at, at CSU Global is align with a lot of these agencies. So uh, we actually have a, a, a very exclusive partnership with FEMA uh, and with the IAEM, the International Association of Emergency Managers. And we've actually integrated all of their coursework into our classes. Um, and that really helps because it gives the, the um, you know, the, the add-on benefit of the coursework, but also um, those, those certifications and the independent coursework that you do with FEMA is all included in our, uh, in our curriculum. So um, it's very hands-on, um, and that's what, that's what we try to do. Um, and, and as far as a career story, you know, I mentioned a few of them, um, you know, when I was on the catastrophe team. And also, um, you know, when I was, in, um, I was in Mexico about two years ago during an earthquake, um, and I worked actually for almost a month uh, with two different carriers, uh, two different companies, uh, on the private level, uh, trying to assess some of the risk and, and recover some of their damages from the earthquake. Uh, so I was right in ground zero uh, two days after it happened. I got deployed there and I spent a lot of my time there. Um, so again, very, very exciting work, very, very humanitarian as well, very rewarding. Um, so, so definitely an area uh, that, that should be uh, a strong consideration uh, for those entering the, uh, entering the industry. So homeland, uh, homeland security, uh, of course, we all know the, the threats we face international uh, and, and domestic. Um, and I think, uh, you know, th there's so many government jobs, you know, it's not just working for Department of Homeland Security uh, on the border, uh, which is an incredibly rewarding, rewarding career, uh, but there's so many different areas uh, within homeland security. Um, you know, I have a good friend, a good colleague of mine uh, that, that actually worked, uh, he, was, uh, he was military, then he worked police, and now he's an analyst with Homeland Security. Um, and, and I think, you know, as far as background and skills needed, uh, I think a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of folks that I've dealt with in Homeland Security do have that military or law enforcement uh, background. Um, also security, uh, any type of security background uh, absolutely can, uh, can assist. Um, and as far as pathways, you know, again, um, being, you know, I think, I think some of these larger government agencies and Homeland Security is one of the largest, um, they look for individuals with all kinds of backgrounds, you know, whether it's finance, um, actuary, whether it's corrections even, 
Um, so, so one can go into this area uh, with, with a wide degree, you know, of, of specializations um, and then decide maybe on what area they like um, and, then, and then work within, you know, uh, within that field to get those additional certifications, to get those additional degrees, um, you know, to add, uh, to add significant value to their, uh, their skill set. Um, and I think, um, you know, uh, DHS focuses on, on so many, um, you know, so many different areas, um, again, you know, getting into the natural man-made disasters. So they work within FEMA, um, even plane crashes, um, you know, they, these fall under, um, you know, their guys too. So they can, they can implement their authority uh, if need be uh, in any of those, uh, any of those type of disasters, but in, incredible, um, you know, incredible opportunities. And, you know, with a lot of these government agencies, it's important to note that, um, you know, it, it, there's kind of a misconception that you have to be a sworn in officer carrying a gun and a badge and traveling all around the world. That's not correct. A lot of colleagues that I know, um, you know, are grounded in a certain area uh, and they're working, um, you know, in an office environment um, and analyzing, um, you know, trends, working with military, coordinating, working in the policy, um, you know, uh, policy application uh, environment. So there's so many different areas to work in and explore uh, within, uh, within Homeland Security that are very, uh, very exciting. And lastly, uh, so cybercrime, uh, we can't forget cybercrime. And again, as you remember from the, uh, the early statistic, this is an area uh, that the research uh, has shown will grow to an incredible, uh, incredible degree. Uh, I mean, you know, we can't open up MSN or newspaper or, or any, any feeds that we get uh, without seeing something related to cybercrime, whether it's a breach, uh, whether it's some sort of identity theft, um, I mean, it is in it is in the news, uh, you know, on a, on a daily basis. Um, well, what does that mean for us? Well, you know, there are many people that that need to be qualified in this area um, to to support those, uh, to, you know, to help companies identify those threats. Um, and and really, you know, I think there's also a misconception in this area that that someone has to have a IT background and know how to code. Um, I worked in this industry, uh, the cybercrime industry, for many years. I consulted with an international company uh, in cybercrime. Uh, I do not have an IT background, um, but I do have an awareness, uh, you know, and I developed an awareness uh, through, um, you know, through education, through taking additional courses uh, in the cybercrime area. Um, and again, I, I never got into coding. Uh, I still don't know how to code. I don't, I don't wish to code. Um, but I can, I can get off the ground with a cybercrime investigation with, with um, you know, if someone's identity is stolen, um, you know, we can, you know, at least I have the expertise to, uh, to start that investigation, you know, where to begin um, and, and can advise others on that. And that's really, in my opinion, what's needed because a lot of people uh, in this area just don't know where to start, right? Um, and I think, I think that's going to be where the biggest job opportunity is going to be is, is in that, you know, I call it the translator positions, you know, uh, where you have those highly tech individuals that, that can actually dig around and research IP addresses and things like that. And that's in the IT space. Um, and then you have the, um, you know, those that have the strong investigative background. Um, but what you need is that middle ground where you translate those things. You know, you have a, a crime that's bucketed as a cyber crime. Um, okay, where do you start with it? You know, where do you uh, you know, where do you, who do you talk to first? Um, you know, who has authority? Uh, things like that. And that's, in my opinion, where I think the biggest growth will be. So getting the background and skills could be anything, um, you know, and, and you know, strong, um, you know, any type of military, uh, investigative background, security, um, you know, really, uh, you know, any, anyone can come to the table uh, with, with some uh, awareness uh, in the cyber area and really be beneficial. Uh, in this uh, in this area, um, you know, and I think you know, as far as career stories, I think what's important to note is that um, you know, in criminal justice itself, and I guess this is kind of a, a, a wrap up, if you will, or a, a general statement as as to all these that I went over. Um, there are so many opportunities in the private sector, uh, and that's where I lived for 22 years. Yes, I was sworn in. Uh, I did a lot of work in the public sector as well uh, with the ATF and with immigration and the UN. Um, but I was always a private sector, um, you know, a contractor or employee, uh, if you will. And there's so many opportunities in that private sector um, that, that, you know, I mean, I can tell you probably 
I would say maybe every three weeks, every month through my career, I would, I would, uh, you know, come across someone, um, meet someone, talk to someone, need to deal with someone. And I was surprised at the occupation that they had. Um, you know, I remember I had this case way early in my career uh, and it involved some, some, uh, you know, um, uh, so some internet thefts uh, and we tracked it through North Face, you know, the, the, you know, fantastic clothing dealer. Well, um, I, I somehow got in touch with a special investigations unit at North Face. You know, d d does anybody know that they exist? Absolutely not. Um, but, but they were highly credentialed. Uh, you know, they worked, uh, you know, a little bit in the loss, loss um, uh, recovery field, but they had a strong investigative uh, team as well. Um, so, so that kind of opened my eyes. Um, you know, uh, Disney, you know, any of, these, any of these places that you go to, you know, Disney and, um, you know, these, these water parks, they all have surveillance going on. They usually have ghost employees, you know, that is undercover people making sure there's no, um, you know, quote unquote, funny stuff going on in their, um, you know, in their, in their parks. Um, there's so many exciting jobs like that, that, that um, you know, are out there. Um, and that's, you know, looping this back to cybercrime, you know, I worked, um, you know, on, on what they call red teams, uh, and they were private contracted positions where what we would do is we were actually paid uh, by a company to come in and try to break into the company. Uh, they call those red teams. Uh, and there was two components. There was a physical aspect of that and also the cyber aspect. Um, so what would happen is, um, let's say Acme, uh, Acme Insurance Company or Acme Government uh, Agency, um, there would only be usually two or three people within that circle that would hire us, um, you know, so it was the most authentic assessment we could do. Um, and then we would come in unannounced. I mean, we would coordinate with local law enforcement, uh, so we weren't um, arrested or shot on site, uh, if you will, but we would come in and we would actually try to break into these facilities on a physical level uh, and also on a cyber level. So super exciting stuff. Um, and then what we would do is we would present our findings uh, to these companies. Um, we actually did a couple uh, of these uh, situations in schools, uh, school environments um, on a local level, uh, which, which where we would, we would actually try to, uh, you know, to infiltrate a school um, and see, you know, how far we could get, you know, and, and this actually was, was very rewarding for me because um, then we would go back and deal with the administration on ways they could beef up their security. Um, so, you know, there's so many exciting areas to work in uh, in criminal justice. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I strongly encourage you to explore these areas. There's, there's so, many out, so many of them out there. Um, I'm available. Uh, if anyone has any questions, um, you can reach me uh, right at michael.skiba at csuglobal.edu. Uh, if you have any questions on any of these careers or anything else for that matter, I'm more than happy to, uh, to expand on that. Thank you so much, Michael. That is fantastic insights and stuff, but a lot of different trends and a lot of things um, happening within the field of, of criminal justice in general. Um, so thank you very much. We do have some questions coming in that we can run through now. Um, I'm going to start with actually one of mine. You just kind of brought up an interesting point that I think was pretty fascinating. When you're looking at like North Faces and Disney and these companies that you know you wouldn't think of having these kind of fraud or emergency management or risk assessment sort of teams, can you talk about how you translate kind of? And I know that we focus on some of those important skills within our courses. Can can you talk about for our current students and alumni that are looking for for jobs within those private sector companies? How do you translate what you're learning towards those those industry um, needs? Yeah, uh, great question. I think that's one of the things. Um, you know, as I, as I work, you know, I was, um, uh, you know, always involved in academics for 15 years. So, so when I worked, you know, I kind of always wore the dual hat, the professional hat and the academic hat. And then, you know, when I had the opportunity to, to, um, you know, take over as department chair that, that at Colorado, that's one of the big endeavors that I had and big goals was to, um, you know, to actually uh, uh, look at, you know, kind of, okay, what's, what's the end value to the student? And, and what we, we decided to do is work a lot of those things back uh, into the course room. Uh, and our faculty are, um, they're all practitioners. So these are all people that are either working in the field um, or, um, you know, uh, or have worked for, you know, usually over 20 years. Um, you know, perfect example, one of, one of our uh, lead emergency faculty uh, uh, members has actually uh, been deployed, um, you know, uh, three, four weeks ago. And he's active in the classroom right now. Uh, so he's in Japan uh, and he's doing some work uh, right now. So he, he's kind of giving live feeds back to the course room as to, hey, um, you know, you read this week, uh, you know, about, about, you know, good ways to, 
uh, work a crisis management uh, plan. Well, hey, this is what it looks like, uh, you know, in real life. So I think, uh, you know, for us, I personally uh, took it as a, as a personal endeavor of mine to, to make sure that all of our courses, um, you know, do have that element, uh, you know, that element uh, within them. Um, and also, too, I mean, one of the biggest things I think in criminal justice is that sense of community. Um, and we've really tried to focus on that, that networking and, you know, we have, uh, so we have an alumni association um, and that's very, very important. Um, and also those partnerships with other agencies, um, you know, in fraud management, for example, we have a, a exclusive membership uh, or partnership, I should say, with the Coalition Against Insurance Fraud. Um, and accordingly, we have a research team of four PhDs, including myself, uh, and two of our students, two of our, our um, fraud management students that are performing this seminal study on uh, insurance fraud prosecution. So we actually had a call this afternoon on this, dissecting data. We're actually going to present this to their board uh, and their members of over 3,000 people uh, come December. Um, so the students will be published uh, here, but they're also going to get incredible exposure uh, hands-on uh, to, to all of these individuals and that huge network. Um, so I think that's one of the things that we really try to do is, um, you know, focus on those, um, you know, those unique, I mean, you know, we have the traditional approach to policing, courts, corrections, but also try to, uh, to open those additional options up that, that might not even be known, um, you know, when a student starts, uh, starts the coursework. That's great. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to jump around here a little bit. We, we had a question came in that, again, you just kind of touched on something that I think is important. So with technology emerging as it is, how do you think that will affect the jobs of tomorrow that rely on such face-to-face -face communications, police officers, court systems, all very physical sort of things? How does technology influence that? Yeah, a super question. And I think um, what's going to happen uh, is that the jobs uh, of today will exist. They will continue to exist in the, in the future, you know, in the 5, 10, 20 year future. But I think um, if you take those titles and basically, um, you know, add the word data or technology in there somewhere, I think that's going to be where it's at. So it's, you're always going to need police officers, but um, we're going to need police officers that, that you know, are, are technology focused or data focused. So, you know, a perfect example is, the days, you know, when I started working, um, uh, you know, organized crime in the city, you know, we would, we would be doing a surveillance on someone and we'd have, let's say, five people, uh, five physical people on that, on that person. Uh, and, you know, doing the traditional, you know, walkie-talkie, hey, he's going this subway, you caught him off, that type of thing was incredibly labor intensive. Um, right now, you can have one officer in a van or maybe not even, uh, you know, in, in the comfort of their uh, department probably running surveillance on that person if they're tech savvy, you know, being able to track phones and, and track them through uh, feeds uh, on the computer, uh, or maybe even one person, um, you know, following that person. Um, so um, it's incredible, but you still need those, those hardcore skills uh, of an investigation, an investigator or conducting a surveillance or how to do it. Um, so there's always gonna be that element, but just adding that tech piece uh, to that. So, so making yourself more um, valuable uh, by adding those technological tools and capabilities uh, to those already traditional home ground foundational um, skill sets, I think is going to be the key. So that's, a, that's a great question. Um, and, and I'm going to go off book here for another minute because the way you make it sound is that every job is like CSI Miami. Is, is that a realistic career expectation for someone just getting into the field or what what is the kind of level set for all of these different pieces yeah uh, super question no not at all uh, as a matter of fact there is there is a uh, a term the csi effect we call it where um you know a lot of a lot of the public uh, feels like you know a day in the job is going to be five um you know car chases and and helicopter rides and absolutely not um so those cases you know like i mentioned uh, so so let's say, um, you know, in, in a month, let's say a surveillance, I'd probably be doing paperwork and other types of maybe, um, you know, menial work for almost a month, but then, you know, we'd be out for two or three days on that surveillance. So it definitely pinnacles, but absolutely. I don't know any job uh, in any field, whether it's federal, state, local, that has that, that uh, you know, daily um, representation of a movie. It's, it's very far from that. 
Um, but but those exciting, uh, you know, exhilarating rewards are still there, but just less frequent. Um, but um, but yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There's there's you know uh, opportunities for those, um, you know, uh, uh, you know for that type of you know action, if you will. But but it's it's not as frequent as as what's on TV for sure. Yeah. Which I figure, but you're still helping people, right? And it still is exciting and so on. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So we have a question in here about um, somebody who is a law enforcement officer and wants to continue to be a law enforcement officer, but is just considering education for promotions. Should he check with his department? It's a, it's a bit of a long story here, but for should how do, how do you make sure that your degree is relevant towards your promotion and, and your pathway, I guess? Yep. Yeah, and it, it really, what I've seen, it, it depends on the department. So, um, you know, we've worked with, um, uh, you know, local, state, and federal departments. We have partnerships with a lot of them. Um, and what I found is that uh, every single one is unique, you know, even across, you know, municipality to municipality. Um, everyone is unique depending on their structure, um, the culture uh, within the department, um, the competition uh, as well. Uh, but one thing I do know is that education is always seen as a next step. Um, you know, so even you know, for example, some of the, the departments local to me, which I've done a lot of training in, um, you know, even just to qualify to take an exam, you had to, you had to show that you were advancing your career uh, on an educational level. Uh, so not necessarily even that you had a degree, but that you were taking courses the next level up. So if it was an associate, you were taking, you know, bachelor's uh, uh, level uh, courses or, or um, you know, vice versa. Um, and I think, too, it really, this is where, right, a, a communication with uh, the department, the HR division, um, you know, the, the uh, training sergeant uh, would come into play because a lot of times what, what we find is, um, you know, in certain departments, you know, other areas might be very useful, you know, outside of criminal justice. So it could be accounting, uh, you know, potentially or, um, you know, or white collar crime or fraud investigations or forensics. So uh, or management, you know, leadership and management. So exploring those areas really depends on the uh, on the department. Um, but it always seems like the, you know, educational component, uh, certifications is always a very strong point uh, in getting the opportunity to advance uh, within, the, uh, within the department. Okay. Last question we have time for here, and it's one that, you know, came up last time we did this in March, too. So I'm going to re-ask it again since people are very curious about this, of course. Um, finding these jobs that you're talking about, are there any career... Um, resources um, specific to criminal justice or emergency management, any specific sites that people should check out in order to get connected with those jobs and see if they qualify and, and what resources can you recommend? Um, I mean, the, the uh, uh, you know, most agencies now have websites. Fantastic. So you can go right on FEMA. You can go right on USAGov's, um, USAGov.com um, and, and look at some of those contracting uh, uh, positions. Um, and even just, just, some basic internet searches will start you off in, in the right direction. But I think also with, with partnerships, so that will give you an idea of, of kind of which direction to go. Um, but I think really a lot of it comes back to that network that I mentioned. Um, you know, I mean, all of the, the positions that I obtained uh, were really through my network, um, you know, two through, through um, you know, several students, several um, colleagues of mine that went through school together with me. Um, so I think continuing with those partnerships uh, and leveraging, um, you know, faculty, you know, the faculty that we have here uh, and, and um, you know, their connections um, and, and, our, and partnerships as well. So the partnerships that, that, that we have or uh, that you can leverage from an academic level will, will absolutely assist because that's really where you learn the inner workings of, um, you know, the, um, you know, the non- uh, to say not official version of how to apply, you know, what are they really looking for? They have to post a certain way. Um, so, so I think, you know, again, just to get right to the short answer, any, any, you know, basic uh, internet searches will start, uh, but going on those government websites, help all state, local, federal agencies have their own websites where you can see the credentials. Um, and even, um, you know, professional networking sites, you know, like LinkedIn, um, you know, you can actually connect with people there. Um, you know, again, we have a very large network uh, on LinkedIn and you can actually see what kind of background that they've had, you know, where they came from, what degrees that they've had and how they've got to where they have. Uh, but really leveraging those partnerships, that sense of community uh, in our industry is very, very big. Uh, so however that can be leveraged, 
um, but will absolutely benefit uh, benefit a student for sure. Great. I want to thank again, Dr. Skiba, for all of the, the wonderful insights. And if you apply right now, you can apply for free using the code on screen. And we also have a scholarship going on. So if you or anyone else you know is interested in starting with the program with us at the end of this year, please feel free to um, utilize those tools to get started. Um, and it's one of these exciting careers. So thank you again, Dr. Skiba. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Appreciate everyone for being here today um, for their time. And uh, we'll be in touch soon. Thank you very much.